Well, it's good to see you all again. Allow me to say I'm extremely proud of Pastor Billy Lyle, his dynamic leadership, his compassionate leadership, and he's much smarter and better looking than I am. And so uh, I, I'm just, he's preaching in our Las Vegas church this morning. Our, every, we planted the church back in uh, 2013. He sends his greetings. And I'm proud to see my granddaughter, Maddie Madison, is one of the camera people up here. I, have, I can't tell you what joy. That, that may bring me more joy than Pastor Billy being the pastor here. I'm not quite sure. Well, the year is 874 B.C. King Ahab, perhaps the most wicked king in, in Israel's history, had plunged God's people into deep idolatry, deep immorality, and violence. And God used the prophet Elijah, and we've been on this journey. He used the prophet Elijah to prophesy a judgment of drought and rain, uh, drought and famine, no rain for three and a half years. Now, today, we come to the place where that period of discipline has come to an end, and Elijah makes a bold prediction to the king who had sought to kill him for three and a half years. He had been on the run for three and a half years, protected by God, a fugitive with a contract on his life. And here is the conversation as we start this morning. In 1 Kings, the 18th chapter, Elijah said to Ahab, Go up, eat and drink, for there is a sound of the rushing of rain. So Ahab went up to eat and to drink, and Elijah went up to the top of Mount Carmel, and he bowed himself down on the earth and put his face between his knees, and he said to his servant, Go up now, look toward the sea. And he went up and looked and said, There is nothing. And he said, go again seven times. And at the seventh time, he said, behold, a little cloud like a man's hand is rising from the sea. And he said, go up and say to Ahab, prepare your chariot and go down, lest the rain stop you. And in a little while, the heavens grew black with clouds and wind, and there was a great rain. And Ahab rode and went to Jezreel. And the hand of the Lord was on Elijah. And he gathered up his garment and ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. Abraham's momentary desire for sustenance delays his, his desire for revenge. And what unfolds in this incredible story here is a narrative of truth for all of us where hope is famished in our lives. Here's what we learn. Are you ready? Fasten your seat belts. Here we go. First of all, pro proclaim belief and begin to pray. Where is that area where hope is famished? Proclaim belief and begin to pray. Automatically, our tendency is just to pray. But uh, Elijah made a point to make a confession of faith based on what he knew God's character would be. Because without evidence, Elijah announced to Ahab, he announced to everybody, that there was a sound of rushing rain when there was no such manifestation of evidence yet. And he announced that the breakthrough that had not yet happened was happening because he had confidence in God. And quite often we put our confidence everywhere else. And here's the remarkable thing. Ahab, who hated Elijah, listened to him. Listened to him. But at the same time, Elijah took to fervent prayer, and he, he assumed one of the classic uh, postures for Hebrew intercession. Now, allow me to pause here in this thing about prophecy. Prophets who exist today, Jim LaFoon is one of them. He's been with us many times. He returns for the first time in uh, two to three years. Next month, as he gets ready to prophesy the next era of our church's future. Jim has been hailed by prime ministers and presidents and was the lead prophet when Hurricane Katrina buried New Orleans in that awful, awful storm. Prophets, God gives them the gift to predict and to see the future and also to see into the hearts of men and women. That's just a natural propensity. They don't even have to try. Elijah was one of those guys. But about prophecy, we can, in our country, receive prophecies of revival, and we have, especially during the pandemic. We can receive prophecies as a church. 
over our personal lives, many of us have received prophetic words. But prophecy without prayer won't produce a fulfillment. In other words, God is providential. He is sovereign. And He can declare what is going to happen, yet He does not exclude the responsibility of human beings to pray that it would happen. It's the mystery. God says, I will do it, but He also invites us to participate through prayer and intercession that He will do it. Are you confused? Hopefully not. So it's both and. It's not just either or where God is just purely independently sovereign and we can do whatever we like and the word of the Lord come to pass. So our church that is 29 years old in October essentially is the outcome of prophetic words spoken over myself and my wife as founders through the decades that have ensued. We have prayed... We have prayed simply what the Lord has said our church is supposed to be. I'm not an ambitious guy. Okay, I didn't set goals up strategically like a businessman to say, these are the targets we are going to hit. All I did was I saw the prophetic destiny proclaimed by the prophets of God, and I said, Lord, if that's who we are supposed to be, then that is what I'm going to pray we become. So when we say, why are we a church planting church? Why are we a missionary sending church? Why are we a young people's church? Why are we a church that focuses on relational small groups when most churches in North America in particular focus on programs and big events? Because this is the way the Lord said we should build. It's called obedience. And sometimes that obedience is counterintuitive. And counterintuitivity is what typified Elijah. Prophets are weird people. I mean, Jim's weird. Jim can tell you what's going to happen, what's happening in your life that you don't even know is happening in your life. And later on, you go, whoa, that's what happened in my life. But once he leaves this building, he doesn't know where Starbucks is. He can't find his car. And we need to walk him into the restaurant. You see what I'm saying? The gift operates only in certain uh, contexts and realms. Well, he's going to be, be with us next month, and I can't wait because this is going to be a dynamic coming out party for a new generation under Pastor Billy, under Pastor Paris, and uh, our young congregational leaders. But here's the pause. Elijah prays even though he has already predicted what God has said would happen. And for those of you who've received prophetic words, put your face between your knees, so to speak, bow, and intercede. Because it could be that perhaps the road to your destiny has been stuck because God is saying, I've already proclaimed it, I've already predicted it, but you need to pray it. The first drops of revival are falling. It started when Damar Hamlin turned the Bengal Stadium into a prayer meeting. And raindrops continue to fall. And we need to continue to pray in a country deeply challenged that God would move with another great awakening. So knowing this is how God works, Elijah bears down then, secondly, to practice perseverance. Verse 43, he said to his servant, go up now, look toward the sea. And he went up and looked and said, there's nothing. And he said, go again seven times. So Elijah told his servant to look for evidence because he had expectation. He had hope. And having expectation is tied to having hope. And hope eventually morphs into a living, active faith. Hope and faith in Scripture is similar, but it's different. Hope is something in the future. Hope is something you aspire to that's a bit far away. We all have a living hope that Jesus will return to the earth again, the second coming of Christ. We also believe that, but it's more of a hope because it's way out there. But they say that the oxygen of life when you're challenged and your back is against the wall is hope. Hope that things can change, hope that things will change. And during the pandemic, lots of people lost hope. I had friends who committed suicide. I had friends who died of COVID. I had friends 
who died simply because they died. I did way too many funerals and burials during that two and a half period of time. And I also see that the aftermath of anxiety and mental health challenges have left people a bit foggy about the future. This is a time for Jesus Christ. This is a time for the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a time for believers to breathe hope into the air. It's time to hope again. Where have you lost hope? Where is that area that you need to make a choice to hope again, even though there's only a sliver of evidence? Having a sense of expectation can often be the difference between arriving at your future or missing it. So he told his servant seven times because he sensed the evidence might not happen immediately. There's this thing about God that Elijah knew that I've found in 50 years of walking with the Lord. The Lord always loves to work at the end of the fourth quarter of a game. He loves the two-minute drill. He's never early, and with the Lord, slow is fast. And it has bugged the heaven out of me for 50 years of walking with Jesus. I wish that for once the Lord would come quickly. And if you're like me and Elijah understood this, he knew, I'm going to have to tell my servant to keep looking because it probably won't happen on the first or second time. And maybe in that process, you've lost hope. Allow me to say, by the word of the Lord, it's time to hope again. It is time to hope again. Expectation can create evidence that can turn hope into faith. And once you tap into faith, you please the heart of God. Because Scripture says, it is faith that moves the heart of God and quickens the hand of God. Without faith, we can't please Him. And by the way, if you need a ton of evidence, then that no longer qualifies as faith. Faith is the evidence not seen and is not an emotion. It is a decision. So here's what Elijah does, okay? He proclaims belief. He begins to pray. He practices perseverance. And then, as we close today, he applies faith to small beginnings. This is huge. This is a major takeaway to take into our relational small groups this week. At the seventh time, he said, Behold, a little cloud, like a man's hand, is rising from the sea. And he said, Go up, say to Ahab, Prepare your chariot and go down, lest the rain stop you. And in a little while, the heavens grew black with clouds and wind, and there was a great rain. After three and a half years, three and a half years of dryness and crisis, an instant downpour would have been nice. No, it was just a tiny little cloud on the horizon. Sometimes that's all God gives us at first. Every time I read this, I go, man, three and a half years no rain, bad food, scrounging around. After three and a half years, if I were God, I would let it storm. But I'm not God. It's a little cloud. Sometimes, some of you, that's all you have. And the Lord waits to see what you'll do with that little cloud, that tiny bit of effacence, the small. Here's what Elijah did. He just applied faith. He said, that's it. That's all I need. God is going to move. He's already moving. Everybody get ready. Get into position. And the Lord is very pleased when we have that disposition, that sense of faith. We should listen closely. When we apply faith to the smallest of hopes, we can turn empty skies into the biggest of rains. Where does it need to rain for you? God first says, I'm going to give you a little, and I'm going to see what you do with less before I give you more. Elijah said, that's all I need. I'm going to take the little cloud. I'm saying, I'm going to take that as God, you're beginning to move. That's why drops of revival are falling in America first. He's waiting to see what his people will do. Will you continue to pray for what has been prophesied so that it will come to pass? Or will you go, you know what? 
to the Mar Hamlin thing, Asbury. That was nothing. We were just, it was just my imagination. We just got a little overexcited as Christians tend, tend to be. Or will you say, no, no, no. We just got to go keep looking. We got to keep praying and keep looking. It's not the first time. It's not the second time. It's not the third time. It's not the fourth time. It's not the fifth time. It's not the sixth time. It's the seventh time. I'm holding back. Okay, because you've had a lot of Dr. Billy Lyle here, so I'm trying to behave. <laughs> Back in my day, I'd scream, throw my shoes, spit, and, you know, get excited. But I'm older now, so I behave. <laughs> Where is that little cloud for you? Or have you dismissed it? Saying, that can't be God, because if God would move, it'd be bigger. It would be a bigger splash. It'd be a bigger cloud. There'd be a bit of a downpour at least. But see, God doesn't work in the way we expect. So in Isaiah chapter 55, the Messianic prophet Isaiah who saw Jesus and his coming and his nature more than most of the other prophets, he writes, My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. As you know, today's guest spot to illustrate our message is Bobby Curran. Who is Bobby Curran? Bobby Curran is one of the most recognized, voice, recognized voices in the state of Hawaii for 30 years plus. He's been the official radio voice for the University of Hawaii football and basketball program. And he's dabbled in other things. But there came a time in his life, and it culminated about nine months ago, where pulmonary fibrosis combined with advanced emphysema laid before him a death sentence. And when we had lunch together at Murphy's in September of last year, he was given two months to live unless a series of miracles could happen. And... Given just a little sliver of a cloud of hope with well-meaning people around him saying, just enter hospice and be made comfortable, Bobby Curran decided to hope again. And then hope turned into faith. And this past Monday, he breathed air into ESPN and went back on the air, returned to his job as the voice interviewing Neil Everett, who just retired as ESPN Sports anchor, Los Angeles, Neil's from Hawaii, and golfing legend Mark Rolfing. Nine months ago, if you said that this would be his future and his reality, if you were with me having lunch with him when he, as he rolled his oxygen tank in with a tube and a mask and struggled at times to walk, you probably would have said, well, I don't see much hope here. Maybe being made comfortable is the way to go unless you can believe that through a little cloud of evidence, God can do anything. Will you stand to your feet and welcome our guest spot today, Bobby Curran. And I might add, one of the rare honors for Bobby is he was inducted into University of Hawaii's Circle of Honor. All right, and that's essentially the Sports Hall of Fame here. It's an incredible, incredible honor. So it's an honor to have you, my brother. All six feet, two of you. I don't know why a lot of you athletic guys like Coach Drew and I, I, I every, I'm just, my face gets crushed into your breast every time I hug you. And I thought it's the first time I've said that in church. Okay, so you may be seeing. Too much information, too much information, too much information. Um, I, <laughs> um, 
I, I just think back, Bobby, to when we had that lunch at Murphy's. Yeah. And uh, is, this uh, is Bobby on? Let's just, just try to turn him on. Bobby, try, give us some of that UH touchdown stuff. Yeah, make it up, yeah. Fall, fall camp just opened. I'm wearing this shirt in honor of you and our warriors who just opened camp. And I was at practice okay, let's do this. Is this is the switch on? I believe it is. Okay. Doctor, by the way, Gordon is a doctor. Yeah. It was, it was here. It was here. Okay, keep talking. Bobby, I'm so sorry. You're used to the headset, which is how you we'll announce games. We have to go back to All that. Right. Technical okay. difficulties. Okay. All right. I'm used to those. Yeah. Um, I, I, just, I, just, I just look back at your journey. So many things had to happen right. But what did happen right first was your family. So we have a picture of them. Maybe you can explain them <laughs> to us. They have to explain, actually. But uh, that's me on the left, obviously. And then... Uh, my son, my youngest, is Finn, and he just graduated from Midpac, and he's now with his mother in Scotland. They're going to be coming home very shortly, but they've been looking at universities, and because he, when he went there to high school to St. Leonard's for one semester, he got a British passport, and so he can get, they have a much more sensible approach to university tuition than we do, so that's a possibility for him, and next to him is my son, Max, who has is now at the University of Hawaii, also a mid-pack graduate, and my long-suffering wife, Jo, is on <laughs> the right. <laughs> she is uh, amazing. No, she is an amazing woman. Um, I mean, hospice, a hospice nurse, um, she's also in commercial real estate. Um, she's been on the radio with you. Uh, in the and past. by herself. And by herself. She's now doing the videos for the Chamber of Commerce in addition wow. to her commercial wow. real estate responsibilities. So Th this is a superwoman. There's nothing she can't do. And the dining out section in the Sunday paper. Right. I mean, you know, that is her. And so a number, a number of things. So, Bobby, you're a well-kept man. Well, I am that and grateful for it. Um, when you survived what has been an ordeal that took so many things to have to happen for that to happen. We had a celebration moment. And uh, we can show the picture of this breakfast here as the evidence. So here we are. We're seated here. This is at the Kahala. It's Coach June, and that's Artie, uh, who was just with us. And th there's you. When you ordered the corned beef hash with the egg, I just remember the lunch at Murphy's, and we watched to see how you would eat that as evidence of your recovery, and you inhaled the whole right. thing. <laughs> I've always had a good appetite until this, yeah. uh, this recent uh, setback, so, and that does take your, I, I was down 148 pounds in the hospital, and I'm usually about a buck 85. Okay, we're going to have to hold that mic. Keep oh, sorry, it close it's not high enough? Sorry about that. They're, yeah. they're working on it. I was going to pretend yeah, that this was still working. It. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've done that, by the way. Um, and then you walked up those two flights of stairs. I remember I asked you, uh, Bobby, do you want to take the elevator? We have an elevator here. And you said, no, no, I'll walk up the stairs. And I thought, I better come behind this guy, which is not too much hope if you can see how diminutive <laughs> I am. Then we'll both be in the hospital. There you go. But anyway, and I was amazed that you just went straight up two yeah. flights of stairs, no problem at all. I said, Bobby is back. But lots of miracles had to happen right. consecutively. I would say there were some were miracles, some were semi-miracles. Yeah. I mean, we went the whole gamut when I was in Phoenix I mean, at this St. Is Joe's the Hospital. So, there was a litany of them. Talk to us about the miracles that had to happen. For well, you to be here. I, I, first of all, you go there and you have to get evaluated. So they're looking to see, I think part of what they're looking to do is see if you can pay for it, but they also are looking to see if, <laughs> and you need insurance. Without it, it would never happen. I mean, it's crazy. This, is, it, this is over a million dollars. Yeah, a million and a quarter is the rough estimate. 
And I complicated it by having a couple of falls. So it's called a double lung transplant. Yes. Okay. And that is one of the two best places in the US to have it, because I was originally going to go to Mayo in Rochester, Minnesota. But I went there, and I got evaluated. And uh, I finally, and that's another whole story about uh, getting approved for that. But I did have a doctor named Dr. Hashim Mohammed who really took a liking to me and came into my room and just started to chart. Can I talk to you? I said, sure. He had a notepad, a yellow legal pad. And he was taking notes on my journey and who I was and you know, trying to find more out about me because he was going to represent to the 30 people 30. that make up the committee. Why so many? I don't know. I just they, they want it to be as thorough as possible. And if there's any, you know, like at weddings where they say, does anybody have any reason that this <laughs> couple shouldn't get married? It's like, it was almost that in a medical context. So, But it was interesting because he had said, we're going to get you through this. And I think I don't think without him, frankly, it would have happened. So there's a miracle right there. Right. I mean, this guy from you know India, who, who hadn't met me but twice before, has decided now to represent and advocate for me to be accepted as a candidate. And that that's a miracle. That's right, right at the outset. That's right. a miracle. Right. You know, we were praying for you. Obviously, your small group leader is here, Bobby Ichikawa, somewhere today, and we, he'll, he'll he has a guest you'll meet at the end. A uh, number of groups were praying for you fervently, regularly. Individuals were praying for you. Um, normally, they don't approve. And this is what I've heard. People our age, Bobby, for this procedure. But God came through for you. Yeah. Well, St. Joe's actually has a slightly different philosophy on it than some. Faith-based. And okay. well, they often, so you're right. You know, St. Joe's yeah. is, is a Catholic. It's the auspices were Catholic. Sure. And they still have a lot of clergy even around there. So you do get a different kind of, I think, committed medical person there. That goes to doctors, nurses, all the whole staff right down the line. Now, That's interesting. how long did they give you without the lung transplant? Well, in October, they told me, one of the doctors said, I asked how long I'd last without the, the surgery. And she said, maybe Christmas. So that was three months. So they just pretty much told you you had three months and you could die around Christmas. That's very hope-giving. Well, yeah. yeah, I mean, but then they, they held out the possibility that if you're approved for the surgery, you may live 15 years. Okay. That sounded way better than Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, you know, and I remember you, you literally grabbed on to that. Um, talk to us, because there were loving people who based on good science, we're saying, phone it in. You know, I'll yeah. make you comfortable. Talk to us about that. Because that was a bit of a surprise to me. Well, my wife's a hospice nurse, and she just said, you know, she goes, you know, you're not, you don't have a high threshold for pain. She told you that? Yes, she knows it. I mean, who knows me better than she does? So, and that's just, she's right. She absolutely is right. But I said, well, this is sort of an important one where I just, I got to step up, and I'm going to get some help. And it's celestial help. And I needed that. And I recognized, and I had several, especially in the night of the surgery. Uh, it was supposed to happen at like 9 o'clock at night. And they had trouble with the logistics of getting the lungs to the hospital. And they never described exactly what it was. And they, then they came in and said, well, we just noticed. The anesthesiologist said, we we're not going to be able to give you an epidural because you're on heparin. It's contraindicated. Okay, let's, let's pause right there, Bobby. Lungs, lungs. So you, they said, you're, without lungs, you're going to pass in three months. Right. So they had to find lungs, and it's not like generic lungs. They've got to um, fit. So talk to us about how, fit. What, well, what do you mean? we have a pleural cavity inside, and, and the... Lungs have got to be a good match on size. That's an important thing. Okay. And then they have to take a look at lungs, at the lungs. They're looking totally on tape because they don't have a chance until they get there because they come from all over the place. And I, I still don't know where they came from. But I'm grateful to the donor, but I don't know who he, I assume it was a him because I have a pretty fairly reasonable sized pleural cavity. Be unusual in a woman, not impossible, but unusual. And uh, he said, we're not going to be able to give you the epidural. I said, well, how come? It's contraindicated 
from, you know, with the heparin is contraindicated. So, and the other doctor looks at the guy, he goes, you're gonna do this surgery without an epidural? So, you, okay. I, and he looked at me like, and he says, wow, you must be tough. I said, no, oh, what, wrong guy. <laughs> wrong guy, not, not that tough. Yeah, your unique condition made it, you just, you couldn't take the epidural. So here you were headed for a world of pain. How was it? It was painful. <laughs> I mean, I, you ask a dumb you know, question, you get the right answer. Well, I laughed because yeah. I, after that, and I was talking to a couple of the UH doctors yesterday at practice, and one of them said the dumbest thing he's ever heard is when they ask people, what's your pain level, one at the lowest and ten at the highest? And it is because it's a self-evaluation, right? So, <laughs> you know, I, I, but that night I said, this, I, need, I needed God in the worst way because this was beyond anything I'd ever experienced in terms of pain. And so I, said, I just recognized them. I and we had had a previous, I was here once before, and it was on surrendering. And I said, time. It's time right now. Wow. Turning it over. Wow. Because I can't do this by myself. Yeah. And I recognized that. That was a pivotal, defining it was a pivotal, moment. That was a pivotal moment. Yeah. And other things have built on that since. So, I mean, which I imagine is the similar journey that a lot of people have if, in terms of growing faith, because I, I you know, was raised Catholic, and I would have told you I was a believer, and I, you know, I, I believe in God. Of course I believe in God. <laughs> but how was I manifesting that in my life? And, I, and there were ways I could have done much better, I realized. And then I realized I wasn't going to be left alone. I was going to get help getting better. Talk to, now, what were the, we don't know it's male or female, but these were not, you had to exercise faith again, because these lungs were not, pristinely perfect. Actually, the lungs themselves were perfect, but the history of the donor. Okay, what do you mean by that? Well, he, they came to you and said, listen, full disclosure, he's got hep C. And he said, but that's really not a problem. I would encourage you. The doctor said, would you take these lungs? And he said, absolutely. He said, we give you one pill a day for 12 weeks and that's gone. Hep C is completely eradicable. So I said, that's good. And he says, second thing, we have to inform you that he's been in jail for at least 72 hours, it could be five years, we don't know. It's, we know it's 72 hours, that's a legal requirement we have to tell so you. So lungs with hep C and lungs that have been in jail. Right. <laughs> yes. So he's, they, so they had any problems with that? And I'm like, again, I looked at the doctor because I recognized he was really supportive. He goes, take him. And I took him. Wow. And he said, as far as on tape what we can see, they're as good a pair of lungs as anyone will ever get. And they got there, and he came in just to tell me they're as good as they looked. All those things, Had beginning happen, with the approval of 30 people, lined up within a finite period of time. Yep. How was this formed? Some of them weren't fans either, i got to tell yeah. you, Pastor. I mean, because I had gone down there looking for a, find a way to avoid the surgery. I, I mean, I was hoping they'd say, yes. we got a pulmonary you know, rehab program, you're not going to have to go through this and you'll be fine. And that turned out not to be the case. I mean, they said, well, we don't have anything that can fix the pulmonary fibrosis. That's what's going to kill you. The emphysema we could handle, but uh, for maybe 15 years, but not the fibrosis. That, that's the one that's going to get you by Christmas. So my options became very limited. Either accept that it's time to go or um, take that chance. And I, I decided I wanted to take, I wanted to be around. I wanted to see my youngest son graduate. I'd like to see my that boys. That was a motivation, wasn't yes, it? Yes, it was huge because I wanted to see them get started in life. And I, you know, I got to kid children late in life. And so, you know, I wanted to be around to help them on their way and wish them good, good speed. Your good friend Dave Reardon and I talked. He's a columnist for the sports section. He, he actually said, you know, these guys research stuff. He went, Norman, I got to tell you. Chances of Bobby making it to where he is today were slim. But you know in God, he loves slim. Yeah. He loves he specializes slim. in slim, you could say. <laughs> <laughs> um, Bobby, how has this shaped your belief in God and how you think you'll live moving forward, giving, being given literally a new lease on life? Yeah, I think it's an excellent question. And I... I kind of feel this sort of thing is growing. I'm in a small group now, too. Yes. Uh, courtesy of you helping me get in one. And uh, 
I just think I, I don't want to pretend to anybody that I've always been this you know, a <laughs> religious person. I, you know, I know it was a bit of a wacko at one You're point. You're not alive. You, this is a room full of wackos here. Well, there you go. Yeah. So I'm in good hands, you're saying. You're not alone, but, excuse but me. But in yeah. any case, I, I just felt like it's time, and I, you know, for much of my life, I've been competitive in, yeah. in a competitive market here mm -hmm. in my job, and I just said, you know, there's times I could have been around my family more. Mm. and should be around my family. Talk to us more. about some of the lessons. You know, you, you've, a lot of people who've stared the end reflect. What are some of the things you've learned in this miraculous journey? Well, I gotta tell you, I never got to the point where I said, well, this is probably over in a couple days. Or I, I mean, I never really bought uh, into that. I kind of yeah. said, listen, there's other people who have done this. And there was a Honolulu attorney who had been through this and he was now four years clear. Bob Kessner, and he was unbelievably helpful and giving yeah. answering questions. And I yeah. just thought, you know, if he can do this, I can do it. Great. I mean, that was sort of the deal. Great. And I said, but I'm going to have, I got a secret weapon here. I got Pastor Norm and a whole bunch of faith warriors, <laughs> and I could feel that. And I, part of the reason I'm here is to, I asked him if I could come, because I wanted to thank everybody here. No, Because on Sunday nights, I could feel it there. I really could. That's huge. <clears throat> You know, Bobby Curran is the only person in my whole ministry career that asked to be a guest spot. Normally, our pastors have to threaten them, bribe them, <laughs> and all sorts of things. And Bobby, grateful to God, grateful to you, because you were part of this journey, parting shot. And what it, your, your parting shot on your learnings and a parting shot on wisdom to all of us who are facing back against the wall situations. Everybody's challenges are different. I, the one I can address is the medical one because I saw people in that hospital at St. Joe's in Phoenix that had basically given up. Some really? of them had been, yeah, and, and some of them don't make it. Mm -hmm. So there was, they were telling me the story about one guy. One of the things you can't do with this is you can't drink mm -hmm. ever again. And I like a glass of wine, much mm -hmm. as the next guy. Sure, sure. And uh, that was out. The killer, though, is no raw fish, no sashimi. <laughs> I mean, that's a cr I mean, for a lot of Hawaii people will get that. People in Phoenix are like, so what? <laughs> you know? We cook our fish here. I was like, well, that's good for you. <laughs> but in any case, I, you know, I re recognized that was going to be a tough one. And like for be if I want to have a steak, for example, it has it's supposed to be medium well. I'm fudging that a little bit. Uh -huh. Just a little. Yeah. I mean, I'll order it medium, and if it comes a little too red, I'll send it back. But I'm, I'm, but I'm trying. I, yeah, you got to live. My take, on, my take on that one. So anyway, you know, I'm doing everything. I'm basically doing what I'm told to. How do. How does it feel to doctors. be back on the air again? Oh, I'm, it's unbelievable. And I'm, you know, there were times when I was in Phoenix, where I wasn't sure that was happening. It took a while for your voice to come. You're on feeding tubes. I mean, it's all kinds of. I have a hole in my stomach. You wouldn't believe it's, it's healed over, but it's never going away. As someone reminded me. Right. I said, "Wow, how attractive." <laughs> <laughs> so, in any case, it, I've gotten stronger. I, but I mean, I had trouble getting like up the stairs when it was dark at the first service. Sure. I had to really hold on. Now, yeah. if it's light, I'm fine. And that wasn't the case. I took a couple of headers when I was in Phoenix. One of them, in Fe first of all, in Arizona, people who have been there know this. They don't have lawns. They have like little rocks. And I did a face plant on one of those. I was walking and just, I went to reach out because I could feel myself going and I missed what I was trying to grab, which was like a telephone, you know, or a uh, power line, covered, of course, but, but I missed it. And the next thing I know, there's an ambulance, and I look over to my side, and there's uh, so much blood, I couldn't believe it, because head wounds bleed a lot. And, but this was only a couple of centimeters from my eye. So, miracle number eight, or whatever. <laughs> and, of course, your body has not rejected the organs, which is always... Yeah, no rejection at all so far, yeah. so knock on wood, and thank God. Bobby, uh, here's, I want to say this to you because I've heard this from others. Thank you for giving God credit. In your, you know, I mean, Bobby received the Lord about a month ago. He's not missed small group since. But Bobby... <laughs> Bobby's small group leader name is Bobby. And they're here. They're usually, the Bobby Ichikawa is here someplace in the hall today. He's brought people um, that, that uh, 
need to hear this. I just want to commend you because I hear from others how in your own simple, uncomplicated way, not only do you announce sports, you announce the gospel, you announce God, and you give God the credit to God be the glory, and he's continuing your story. Folks, Bobby Curran. You know, uh, whenever I think now about things where hope is small and I don't have a ton of evidence to believe, all I have to do is reference Bobby Curran because what we've spared you is a lot of the details. It's a book. It's really a book. And uh, it's almost like then there's Joel coming in here and giving her reflections on being married to the man. But that's for another time, okay? That's for another time. In the distant future. In the distant future. Okay. All right. Well, folks, you know, when you think about the nation of Israel, when you think about the wonderful Jewish people, most of them, because they expected a Savior, a Messiah who would be a conquering figure and not a suffering servant who went to the cross, they're still waiting for the Messiah to come. Sometimes our expectations are blown apart, and with that, hope and our propensity to believe. Remember, and Bobby could preach this better, God always works in ways that we don't expect. And if we can just trust Him, if we can let go of our preconceived notions, if we can have trust Him, and like Elijah and Bobby and all of you who prayed for Bobby, if we can just Say, Lord, I'm calling upon you. I'm going to trust you. I'm going to be ready to receive from you. And I'm willing to surrender to you. God will do amazing things. Our pain is usually God's signal to surrender. At his most intense pain point, surgery without an epidural, Bobby came to a place where he gripped the cloak of Jesus. And since then, his life has changed. Will you bow your heads with me? Father, we are a collection. <laughs> Bobby said, wackos, you, your word would say sinners. If we've received you and we know you, we have you in our hearts as our Savior, your word says our identity has changed to saints. We're not perfect, but we're saints and sons and daughters of the Most High God. But for those that are here this morning who have never surrendered to you as Lord and Savior, Father, I want to give them an opportunity, an opportunity to say yes to you in the face of a famished hope. Scripture says to those of you who don't yet have a relationship with Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, Scripture says if we will believe in Him, if we believe in Him that He is God's Son who went to the cross and died for our sins, if we receive Him in our hearts by faith as our personal Lord and Savior, then we have eternal life. We are born again in our spirit and secured a place in heaven. But not only that, the Lord then promises to work in our life on earth to, to form and fulfill the purpose for which, for which we were made. Eternal life begins on this earth, not just in heaven. Bobby Curran has begun that journey of taking his influence and his voice and giving God glory. That's going to be his story moving forward. But guess what? It's all of our story. And if that's you, you say, Lord, I want the gospel story to be my story. I want heaven to be in my future. I want my destiny on this earth to be fulfilled. Then pray this prayer with me as I pray it out loud. And if you've never prayed this prayer and surrendered to Christ before, pray this prayer in your heart. The rest of us who are already Christians and committed believers, will you pray this prayer line by line out loud with me as first-timers pray it in their heart? Let's pray. Dear Lord, 
I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you died for my sins and paid the price for them all. I receive your cleansing and forgiveness. Lord, come into my heart. Take over my life. I surrender to you as my Lord and my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. With every head bowed, Scripture talks about making that confession public. I'm your witness. I'm your witness. Pastor Paris is your witness. If you prayed that prayer, would you lift your hand up high just for a second and put it down? Wonderful. Okay. All right. number of people throughout the congregation. And I want to say this. You've taken an incredible first step to the journey of a lifetime. Tell the person who invited you, I prayed that prayer. And then you'll hear from our host about your next step so your faith can grow. But Father, I pray for the rest of us. I pray, Lord, that you would pour kerosene on smoldering embers of hope that seem so small in areas where our backs have been against the wall. I pray that that kerosene will create a bonfire of faith so that there can be a cloudburst of heaven that pronounces incredible breakthroughs and outcomes. Father, help us to be people that don't discount the tiny, the little, and the small. Lord, help us to be people that understand you always manifest first with very little, and you wait to see how we'll respond. Well, today, we choose to respond at the mention of your name, that you are an awesome powerful, faithful God, and we are grateful.